We are so honored to have Ambassador Mayor Puri with us today. He's not only um, a well-known statesman, but he's a wonderful friend to all of our World Affairs Councils. So it's really, truly special that he's here with us today. I am so grateful that we're able to, to host this lunch, that we're back in person. And one of the wonderful things about the World Affairs Council of Connecticut is, the, is being in Connecticut and being in a global state with so many businesses that are doing business around the world. So much of our economy is dependent on pl other places around the world. And it's uh, very much true for our sponsor to date, uh, Pratt & Whitney. Um, and we're so honored to have Kevin Kirkpatrick with us today to welcome the ambassador. Thank you. I'll, I'll keep this brief, um, but I'll, I'll do a brief introduction here, but just a little bit of background on Pratt & Whitney. So we're very honored to host. We have uh, about 40,000 employees globally, and Singapore has been a, a key hub for us for over 40 years. We have a lot of folks in Asia, but about 2,500 folks in Singapore. And then when you look at Raytheon Technologies, it's real, well over 3,000. You know, I had the honor of myself to live in Singapore for a number of years, and my children just had a great experience there. It's a wonderful place um, if you ever get the opportunity to go. Mr. Ambassador, my, when I came back, I, um, we lost a family dog. Dogs are a big deal here. So we got a new dog, and my dog is named Dalvi. Um, after the road we lived on in Singapore, it was a, you know, so that, everybody's like, why Dalby? You know, <laughs> well, you know, Singapore. Anyway, um, so on to um, our introduction. So, I'm sorry. I apologize. Um, so, um, Mr. Ambassador, um, welcome. Um, he has been the Singapore's ambassador to the United States um, since July of 2012. Um, prior to that import appointment, he was the ambassador um, to Indonesia from 20, 2006 to 2012, and the high commissioner to Malaysia from 2002 to 2006. Um, he graduated with an honors degree from the National University of Singapore, and he received his MA at the University of London School of Oriental and African Studies. And I'll just give one quick example for me that I, I found very interesting. Um, one of the things I realized in Singapore, many of the sites that I went to in the government offices, um, they take a lot of their high, high talent, the best of the best, and they go into service um, to the government. And so I'm sure we have one of the best of Singapore here um, to talk to us today. So welcome. So I can talk a little bit about our format today. Is um, We're going to have a nice conversation. And then I want all of you to be thinking about questions. So we'll open it up to the audience for questions. Perfect. Thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. <laughs> Megan wrote to me a couple of months ago and said, I should come and speak over here. And I've been here for 10 years. And one of the first speaking engagements I did when I came to Washington, D.C. was for the World Affairs Council Conference in 2012. And then we even hosted many of the World Affairs Council guests on their next trip to Washington, D.C. at the embassy. And I've tried to go around the country speaking as often as I can at World Affairs Council. So I think the mission that you do is so important with connecting the United States with the world, getting people to understand a little bit better what's happening outside because the rest of the world knows a lot that is happening in the US. Every day, and Kevin, you know this, the newspapers are filled with news from the United States and other parts of the world as well, because the US is so consequential for the world. But sometimes in the United States, because of where you live, how you, know, you are very well protected and secure, you tend to forget there's a big world out there that depends on you. So the World Affairs Council does put the message out there. And so when you said come, and I'm very happy to be back post-COVID and start doing these events again. So thank you, Megan. Oh, it's truly, truly an honor. So I thought we could start today about talking about your role as ambassador, the representative of Singapore in the United States. 
so can you talk a little bit about when we're looking at the world today, we understand that as we sit here, the world is a very complicated and messy place. But in your day-to-day -day job, what are you know maybe your top three priorities, or what are your top priorities? Well, I've been a diplomat for 38 years. And in Singapore, most of our diplomats are career diplomats, and those are senior ambassadors also are most are career diplomats. And through the course of this, for a small country like Singapore, and some of you in France and Whitney people who fly in and fly out and know how small Singapore is. Singapore is a tiny little dot of an island. I don't have a map over here, but if you try to place us, we're between the Straits of Malacca and the South China Sea at the tip of the Asian continent. We call ourselves a little red dot. Very few countries call themselves small, but we call ourselves a little red dot because we are that small. We're 270 square miles. Uh, a little bit bigger than Hartford, but <laughs> five and a half million people. But then when you are a Singapore diplomat, from the day you come in, right to the roles of ambassador, you then realize that you have to connect with the world. That Singapore by itself cannot survive without the connection to the world. We have an unusual history. We did not actually plan to be independent. We had to leave Malaysia, our immediate neighbor, under very trying circumstances, differences of race and religion, and how we wanted to build up our own future. But when we left Malaysia, we had nothing. We have no energy in Singapore. There's not a drop of oil, no coal, no shale. It's too small for nuclear. We have to import all of our energy. We have LNG terminals that come in that bring in LNG pipe, pipelines that come in. We don't have our food in such a small space, no agriculture. And we have to import our food. What we've done, we actually now have the best food in the world, but that's because we breathe. We import everything in, so you'll hear a lot about Singapore food. We don't even have enough water of our own. We have long-term agreements with Malaysia that were signed during the British colonial period because we were both British colonies that go on until 2061 that allow us to pipe water in from Malaysia every day for filtration and cleaning. But even out of water, we have now developed a new industry. We actually recycle sewage water and call it new, new water. It's very high quality, meets every WHO standard, and that's given us that ability to now be a little bit more independent on water. So when we did become independent, you realize how dependent you are on the world. Every sea lane comes through somebody's waters. Every shipping route comes through somebody's airspace. And the role of Singapore diplomat is making sure you have as much diplomatic space in this world. Part of that, and my role here in the United States, is making sure that that space is actually guaranteed and supported by our relationship with the US. Because the US has played a very long historical role in Southeast Asia, sometimes not a very happy role because of the Vietnam War, but their commitment to the Vietnam War, for example, was really a commitment to anti-communism because we were fighting communism as well at that time, and a commitment to countries of that region to focus on economic development. But over the course of those years, the United States has built up a deeper and deeper relationship with countries like Singapore in particular. And my role is to make sure that we preserve that relationship. We have some of the businesses over here. Uh, Pratt and Whitney, of course, a very good, uh, solid citizen of the Singapore community. There are, like Pratt and Whitney, over 5,000 US companies based in Singapore. Many of them run their regional headquarters out of Singapore. Singapore, our five and a half million people in the little red dot, has more US investments than China, India, Japan, and Korea combined. Just do the sums, you know, sort of those people together are three billion people. But they come to Singapore because we have taken on the US business values. People are there because of rule of law, English speaking, focus on education, an open economy. Even during COVID, we made sure the economy stayed open. 
And we keep, even now we're starting to see U.S. businesses continue to invest into Singapore on vaccines, on biology, of course, the aerospace industry. So that has been part of my role. Another big part of my role, I think in Pratt & Whitney has something to do with this, is a very strong defense relationship between Singapore and the United States. The U.S. had significant bases in the region, but over time they started pulling these back. Host countries did not want to host the U.S. anymore. The Philippines was a very large hub for U.S. activities until 1990. But we opened up our military facilities for the U.S. to use. It is not a U.S. base. It is a Singapore base used by the United States. The largest naval user of our naval base, large user of our Air Force bases, U.S. aircraft carriers can come in, U.S. littoral combat ships are rotated through. And that is part of my role is sort of making sure that that relationship stays, stays stable. And the flip side of that is Singapore has one of the largest foreign military forces based in the U.S. Again, coming from a small country, not a NATO partner, we have more people based over here. And I was speaking to the colonel just now because at Fort Sill, we do some training when he was out in uh, Fort Sill, uh, where we bring our troops here and train them over here. We have Air Force squadrons based in Idaho and in Arizona and soon in Arkansas and in Guam. It gives us that space. So again, that's really much, very much part of it. And that one is really sort of making sure that the diplomacy between the United States and Singapore and the region stays very stable. It's not just for us, it's not just about the US and Singapore, it's about the wider region, Southeast Asia, the Association of Southeast Asian countries, 10 countries, 600 million people. We want to make sure the US is engaged with this region. And in May this year, President Biden invent, invited the 10 ASEAN leaders to Washington DC to the White House to meet all of them. My Prime Minister was there. My Prime Minister, in fact, came twice. He came in March first for a bilateral meeting with the President and then came back with all the ASEAN leaders. So these are the areas in which we work with. And then, of course, there's education, there's cultural ties, there's uh, new areas that we're starting to build. So each one of these, I cannot say one is more of a priority or the other. I'm juggling all these every day and see which, which ball do I catch and throw up and move on to the next ball after that. So where do you see the greatest opportunities um, for the bilateral relationship? So that's enormous, 5,000 US businesses uh, in Singapore. Where, when we're looking at the landscape today, where are the greatest opportunities? I think the greatest thing is really a place for Americans, whether you're in the military, whether you are in a business, whether you are going there as a student, maybe an exchange student, maybe into one of our universities, to see the world from a different perspective. We have many students here and they see the world from your perspective. But you know, I was just talking to Megan before this that we take the World Affairs Council board out to Singapore. Because sitting in Singapore, you suddenly get a perspective of the whole Indo-Pacific. You get a sense of what is happening in India, in China, in Indonesia, because that's that vantage and that's really something I think we should encourage more because that's the opportunity as more people from the U.S. start to understand the world from another perspective. Then whether it's for business reasons, whether it is for because I'm going to school over there, whether I'm going to uh, serve in the military for a little while over there, I think these are the opportunities that we face because sometimes we tend to forget that the most important part of diplomacy is people. You can say, I want more business investments. Yes, that's good, but it's really the people who drive that. I want more security uh, relationship, but it's people. Exactly. Focusing on the people, I think, is that very important part of it. Absolutely. Let's talk about Singapore's geostrategic role. Having just completed our global security forum, and you know, three out of the six panels really focused on the Pacific, the Taiwan question, Admiral Blair talking about power in the Pacific, and Admiral Gilday talking about how the Navy is strategically placing um, the Pacific at the top of their strategy, right? Um, talk a little bit about where Singapore lies in the world. Um, it's important to mention, you know, at the, at the South China Sea, um, it is a really important uh, neighborhood. And what is, what's going on in Singapore? Our success in 57 years, we've been independent 57 years, has really been over a time of great peace 
particularly after you know, the end of the Vietnam War, focus on economic development, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the sort of collapse of the Soviet Union, China joining the World Trade Organization. There's a huge period of stability, and Singapore grew with that. And in a way, as a small country, you cannot shape events like big countries do. Uh, the US can shape events. Russia is shaping some events. China will shape some events. But as a small country, you really take the world as it is. So we look at geopolitics around the world. And in, in it, we wish that we could sort of continue that period of stability and calm that focuses on economic development that moved billions of people out of poverty into relative success. Whether it's you're looking at India, whether you're looking at China, whether you're looking at a country like Indonesia, how you move, and that really requires a piece of a, a time of peace and stability. We are unfortunately at a time when there is some turbulence in geopolitics. For Singapore's role, our approach is really to focus on multilateralism and the UN. Because that's where small states get a little bit more space. It's the voice of the small states together at the UN that maybe it may not stop a Russian invasion of Ukraine, but you know that there is at least a moral voice saying that we don't accept this. It draw attention to the Russian invasion of Ukraine because when it did happen, Singapore came out very critical of it. We joined 141 countries in the UN criticizing that. And then we also, one of the countries that put sanctions on Russia so that they could not restore their military capabilities. But that was a focus on that multilateral world because we think that's important. We think that the importance for a small country of territorial integrity, of rule of law being quite important to us. So that's one geopolitical thing that unfortunately the Ukrainians are suffering dramatically hard to see how this may end in the foreseeable future. But it has a, such a deep impact, obviously, for the United States. But for us, we're having high inflation. High inflation rates in Singapore are traditionally 0 to 1%. We're now at 5 to 6%. It's very large. Energy, we import all our energy. So whatever the energy prices, we pay. There's no sort of discount because it's domestic. Food, we import all our food. So all these things are geopolitical, immediate crisis that become geopolitical concern for us. Then we're in a region in which we've seen the very dramatic emergence of China. Uh, joining World Trade Organization, becoming in our region a very significant economic player. Every Southeast Asian country has China as the number one or number two trading partner. In fact, for the United States, China is one, two, or three. It's Canada, Mexico, China, and keeps rotating regularly as well. China's become such an economic force. And how do we continue to integrate them into the system without all the crises that seem to be coming up, particularly in US-China relations? That's really a concern for countries like Singapore. We are a fairly significant investor in China as well. We have people going back and forth. They have a large number of tourists. Now, of course, COVID, COVID has shut them down. But that is really how do you incorporate a new big power in the global system? Well, we've not seen the emergence of such a big power for almost a century. I mean, maybe the largest big power that really emerged was the US in the early 20th century. The Soviet Union came in but didn't really make that sort of difference. But China's going to make a dramatic difference in all of our lives. 1.4 billion people that want to be successful. Then it's within our own region of Southeast Asia. How do we integrate better economically? Because in a way, Singapore is successful as we are. We cannot be too successful if all our neighbors are not successful. Because that's elements for insecurity for us. How do we work on that? So these are some of the geopolitical challenges we have to deal with. My job is interesting because there are no easy answers. And so that's what you know, keeps us sort of going. How do you sort of navigate the Russia-Ukraine thing, the emergence of China, now also the emergence of, of, of India, 
Southeast Asia. And all this is we're just coming out of a pandemic, which we all didn't expect, which we all thought would be over in two weeks. And two and a half years later, we're still sort of coming to grips with it. Uh, we all left the offices thinking we'll be back in two weeks' time. You know, we left half-eaten sandwiches at our desk or something like that. And we come back and it's all still there. But so these are the global issues that small countries have to deal with. But in many ways, it goes back to some of my opening comment of the role of the United States in all this. Because in many ways, dealing with the challenges of Russia, Ukraine, falls largely on the US, the European partners, and then other friends and allies. Dealing with the emergence of China, US-China relations, is the US is a very key actor in this. Building up economic integration in Southeast Asia, and the administration has rolled out something called the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework for the region. That's the US as well. Even dealing with COVID, if not for the mRNA vaccines, from Moderna and Pfizer, I don't think we'll be where we are today. You know, I think that's very remarkable, the innovation, the entrepreneurship, the ability to get those vaccines out in remarkably quick speed, all driven by the US. Absolutely, and thank you for mentioning um, how you work at the UN, uh, because I'm gonna ask our students to get their questions ready. You may know that one of the programs that the World Affairs Council of Connecticut does every year since 1952 is our Model United Nations program. Mm -hmm. We have two students and their advisor who are were able to get out of class today okay. to be here, the ones that are representing Singapore from Ram High School. Oh, okay. So I want, I, I'm gonna throw to a question to you in just a minute. I'm giving you a warning to come up with some. So um, we talked a little bit about the bilateral relationship between the US and Singapore. Um, how would you categorize the bilateral relationship between Singapore and China? Very good. It is. First, China is geographically in our region. So every country in the region must maintain a good relationship with China. Because they're there. They're a big fact of life for us. In a way, the US can be an optional power. You can opt in and you can opt out. We try and drag you in, but you know, if you wanted to and you've gone through periods of isolation and you can opt out, you're never going to opt out of Mexican geopolitics because for Mexico you're very large, or Canadian geopolitics, or much of Central America. You know, your your future, you have to deal with you know, border issues and other things from there. But for us, China is that fact of life. And then in Singapore, uniquely in every, uh, then compared to every country, we are ethnically majority Chinese. Most of the Chinese who came to Singapore came during the late 19th, early 20th century as China was going through all those waves of crisis that they had, periods of warlords and warring states and you know, empires falling and, and it was a very un difficult place to run. So many came to Singapore. We have a you know, knowledge about China, so we have to work with them. And for our businesses, as they grow out of Singapore, they would go first to Southeast Asia. The next natural place they'd go to is China. Because many of the products, it's, it's much harder for a Singapore business, small, medium-sized industry, to come into the United States, first because of the distance, and some of the sort of differences of doing business. They find it easy, so we're a very large investor in China. So the geography, the ethnicity, the business relationships, and it is, as they have emerged, they actually saw Singapore as a potential model for success. Deng Xiaoping had traveled to Singapore in 1979 and said, okay, this is a possible, how, how can this country work? Uh, and we have invested in industrial our facilities in China, because we want there to be a successful China, because we know the period in which there was an unsuccessful China. And many people left China to come to Singapore. So we have a good relationship with them. Our leaders meet regularly. My president, she was in Singapore, in Beijing this year for the Beijing Olympics. Uh, she met President Xi. And so it's, it's a relationship that we value and treasure. We may not have some of the areas that we do with the United States because it's a very different phase of that relationship. I don't think there are as many Chinese companies invested in Singapore, because when Chinese companies leave, they're looking more for resources. We really don't have resources. There's no reason 
for a Chinese company to manufacture in Singapore because it's close enough that they can manufacture in Shenzhen or Hainan. So you don't really have that level of that somewhat economic engagement. But the number of tourists coming from China before COVID was the largest number of visitors coming to Singapore came from China. Haven't resumed that travel. People from Singapore travel over there, studying, going back and forth. So it's, it's a relationship that we preserve and keep well and you have to keep that balance. That's why US-China relations gives us even more concern because we're good friends with you and we're good friends with them. If you guys are not good friends with each other, it becomes a little bit, think of it in your neighborhood, you know, sort of, uh, you're friends with both neighbors, but they're not getting along well. Was it the Singapore summit um, this, this year when at, at General Austin and his Chinese counterpart got into a little, uh, a little, uh, I don't know how to say, it was a little tense there? Well, again, it's a role that Singapore plays. When President Trump wanted to meet the North Korean leader, Kim Jong-un, of all the places in the world, he picked Singapore. Uh, 2018, June 2018. Because I, I think President Trump, and he showed a little video at the end of that in a press conference of what North Korea could be if they focused on economic development per se. So in a way, we provided that space for countries to connect. Uh, General Austin attends every year. There's something in Singapore called the Shangri-La Dialogue. Which is meant to me, we all think of Shangri-La sort of relaxed. It gets very tense because all defense people over there. <laughs> because General Austin had not met his Chinese counterpart, because of COVID, I think COVID has made some of these engagements a little bit more difficult. The Chinese do not leave. When they do leave, they go back into 14-day quarantines. So many are reluctant to leave. They're still living through that sort of zero COVID period. I think Yes, we all saw those trading of barbs and the tents, but much of diplomacy is also theatre. So we watched that theatre. I think what's more important is the fact that they met after General Austin, after the Biden administration took 18 months in office. They've had meetings at the Foreign Secretary, Secretary Blinken has met his counterpart, and National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan has met his counterpart, but not that many meetings. And what they said in private, which we don't know, maybe at least paves the way for the next meeting, and the next meeting, and the next meeting. As in public, both sides will say, you're wrong about this, and you're wrong about this. But we hope in private, the fact that they're meeting, the fact that they're connecting one-on-one, -on -one, I think that's useful. That's an important um, commentary on the uh, critical nature of diplomacy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My students ready? You stand up and, and try to try to project. I don't think we have a microphone for this. UN, we represent Singapore and we're a part of the World Foods Council. So we're we've know we know a lot about how you import 99% of your food. And our question was you have a new plan in your country to reduce the imports to 70% by 2030, 30 for if by 30. And we were wondering how you plan to implement this involving urban agriculture and how you're planning to share this developments with the entire world. Thank you. That's a great question. And thank you for being part of the Model UN. I think it's a great program. Uh, that again helped high school students to connect with the world. So we brought Model UN students into our embassy as well. It's usually an annual conference or something, and they come to Washington, D.C., and sometimes they come to the embassy. Yep, you spoke about our food program. We have a 30 by 30 program, which is 30% 30 of our food should be domestically sourced by 2030. Part of the impetus for that, and many countries had to go through this, was during COVID when you realized that you actually don't have the resilience. We were so focused on efficiency, the planes will keep flying, the ships will keep sailing, that whether it is the N95 masks that hospitals use, whether it is all the conversation on supply chips, or whether for a country like Singapore, just the food, where do we get it? We get a lot of it from our neighbors, but at the time, the border with Malaysia was closed. Truck drivers, they came in, technically had to do a quarantine as well. And when they went back into Malaysia, they do a quarantine. It means if you, every time you bring a truckload in, in theory, 14 days quarantine in Singapore and 14 days quarantine when you go back into Malaysia. That could not work. 
we worked some solution out. We test them at the border. We made sure how the, where they came in, where they dropped the food. Both sides cooperated on this. But it did give us this point about resilience. First thing, and we've been doing this even before COVID, was a little bit more urban agriculture. People were getting a little bit more interested in agriculture, a little bit more in sustainability, because again, as you think about food being flown into Singapore from Brazil, and we buy a lot of chicken from Brazil, you think of the climate change impact and the sort of uh, the sustainability impact. We say, let's try and do a little bit more domestically for the reasons of sustainability. Then came resilience. And so now, actually, what has become very interesting, aside from the urban agriculture, and we can do this in very large buildings, and now with AI, you can, you know, everything is done on an app. You don't necessarily have to have large fields of land. You can put them up in buildings. Is alternative proteins. Uh, we have a Singapore food agency, which is the only food agency in the world that has approved the use of uh, cell-based chicken. So you take the cell of a chicken and you make it in a factory and you get chicken. And you do chicken rice with that. We're just talking about Singapore chicken rice. And it's a new concept. As we move towards more cell-based type alternative proteins, I think that is something that people are starting to think about, whether it is beef, whether it is lamb, whether it is chicken. There's also a lot of sustainable fish going on. And so we're looking at all sorts of models and ideas. And much of this, actually, many of the ideas come out of the US. We work with US universities uh, to get many of these ideas going. And then we help to implement them and make them marketable not just for Singapore, but maybe globally. So some of you may have tried Impossible, the Impossible Burger. That's got a very large investment from Singapore. It came out from uh, uh, the West Coast. Many of these things, we need to try these things as options because, and it's not just for ourselves. As one billion Indians come up to middle class, they want to eat like all of us. Where are we going to supply the protein for them? How do we get that going? It's not just grain, it's everything else. So I think the world's food demand is going to continue to grow. Singapore's food demand continues to grow. So we are looking at some of these ideas that make them more sustainable, give us a little bit more resilience in our food supply. But it does take, it's not your traditional large farm in, you know, uh, the Dakotas or in Ohio. You know, it's, it's really rethinking how food has to go. And again, in that, many US companies are involved. They work with us, ADM, Cargill, do a number of things and research in Singapore to work with us on these areas. So thank you for that question. Who else has a question? Greg? Mr. Ambassador, Greg Blue with Capo. Thank you for your briefing today. It's been very insightful. As a number of our, our companies are looking to partner and invest in Singapore, we're faced with trying to do a bit more risk management as the ability to have a bilateral relationship is impaired by that multilateral neighbor that you have. How would you in our seats look at that and sort of de-risk investments and engagement in that um, AOR, especially with the security position decreasing? Well, in Singapore, you have no problems. You have, we have a very, very healthy bilateral relationship. We were the first Asian country that the U.S. signed a free trade agreement with in 2004. That, at that time, was a gold standard agreement. It had all the protections for investors. But Singapore by itself has always protected investors. Investors had never had a doubt that their investments are protected, even during COVID. We, whatever was produced, we never stopped anything being exported. And that rule of law, we even have... Uh, a court that is set up of international jurists that can adjudicate disputes if there are disputes uh, between firms, commercial law, and things like that, which foreign judges sit on it because uh, some of these issues that deal with very high standard patents and things like that, our local judges may not have had the experience yet. So with Singapore, you don't really have the problem, which is why Singapore has become the place of choice for many US companies not just to invest in Singapore. When they have, when I said we've, you've got the highest investments in Singapore, you're not just doing it in Singapore, you're using Singapore as a hub to reach out to places, to the rest of the region. And that's where Singapore gives a reassurance to US businesses. 
Then there are other areas you need to think about risk, climate change issues, uh, changing weather patterns. As opposed to the traditional economic participation or support that Singapore is always providing. Singapore has got investors from around the world. We have investors from Germany, from China, from Latin America. We've never found that one influences the other. Everyone is there because they want to make money. Singapore is not a cheap just destination. So I, it's not something that has come up in conversations about you know, there's going to be a negative influence from one country or another country into your investment there. And the government basically gives that assurance uh, in terms of our Economic Development Board, which is the investment promotion. So it's really not an issue that I have encountered any business suggesting that there is outside influence from anyone else coming in. And most of your uh, top technology companies, such as Pratt & Whitney, Boeing is out in Singapore, Google sets up very large facilities, uh, Microsoft, no one has really said that they have you know, influence coming from anywhere else. We're there for the business and we're going to make it succeed. So we'll go Sue and then Sharika. I, I actually have two very disparate questions. Um, the first one is... Oh, Sue, can you stand up? And, sorry. Um, the first question is, you mentioned that there was a large influx of Chinese um, escaping China and moving to Singapore. And in this geopolitical traumatic period, are you seeing a lot of refugees from neighboring countries or the Middle East or Russia trying to get into Singapore? And what is your immigration policy and how you deal with that? So that's one question. Second question is, um, that was an excellent question about you addressing the food import situation. But in terms of the energy import situation, do you have a goal for alternative uses of energy, whether it's wind, whether it's water, whether it's solar, and how has the geopolitical arena these days affected how you can get um, imports of energy? Thank you. Both very important questions. Uh, Singapore has a policy of not taking refugees. So we have got no refugees in Singapore. You know, maybe a straggle or two how we had to deal with during the Vietnam War, because we're too small a space for refugees. We welcome legal immigration. There's fairly strict laws about how that is. We, about a third of our working population are foreigners, but they are legally. Not many intend to, I mean, they're there for a job, but they don't, will not end up living for a very long time in Singapore. Those, there are people who then get onto the track for a green card, what we call permanent residency, on the track for citizenship, and that those people who want to do that. So it's all, it's a very legal process of people coming in. Um, because we're just so small, that we really need to manage that. And because we're also a very multi-ethnic population, we are 70% our majority Chinese who came, uh, said late 19, early 20th century. We also have people of Indian origin. My family came from India to Singapore after the partition of India and Pakistan. Uh, there are people from Indonesia and Malaysia that have come to Singapore. So it's a very multi-ethnic, multi-religious society. So even as we do immigration, we need to preserve this multi-ethnic society. We need to respect each other's spaces. That you know, sometimes immigration can tilt the balance one way or the other. So we're quite careful how that is being managed. We want to make sure that no matter what your race, no matter what your religion, you can live together with everyone else. All our schools, for example, are all public schools that mix people. They all go to the similar type schools and they are mixed. Every 18-year-old male goes into the military for two years, mixed units again. So it, it's really preserving that. And if you want to immigrate to Singapore, you need to understand this value system. You may be of ethnic Chinese origin, but you're a Singaporean Chinese. 
You may be of ethnic Indian origin, but you're Singaporean Indian. You may be of ethnic Malay origin, but you're Singaporean Malay. And you need to understand that value system. Where I grew up as a Singapore boy, understanding Chinese, understanding Malay religions, understanding we were in each other's homes and houses. So when we do immigration, we're fairly careful how that is preserved. We do need immigrants coming. Unfortunately, like most developed countries, we have a very low birth rate. Our total fertility rate is fairly low. So you have to sort of supplement it with immigration. But we want to make sure that as people come in, they follow the rules. So it's a very legal process of people coming in. Uh, on the energy question, the same issue as with food. How do you look at sustainability? Now, currently, we're largely LNG, both pipes and L, uh, terminals, ga uh, gas that is shipped to us. Our difficulty is that we're actually alternative energy disadvantaged. There's very little wind in Singapore to generate uh, power. The reason why Singapore became a very successful hub for the British during the colonial era was that was the place that ships stopped in between the monsoons. So as a sailing ship, before you had the steamships, you had to stop in Singapore and that was a safe place. Uh, we don't have any geothermal energy, there are no earthquakes in Singapore. We, even if we put solar panels on every roof in Singapore, it will probably get us maybe 10% of our energy needs. So we got a little bit creative with solar panels, we now put them out at sea or in floating reservoirs to get a little bit more, but still not enough to do. So we are looking at new areas. Hydrogen is one area that we're thinking about as a possibility. We're also doing partnerships with our neighbors where they would generate the power and we would buy it, whether it is the traditional power generated or whether it's a renewable. We prefer it. they have their renewable energy that they sell to us that we can use and generate. It is a process of then doing that transition so that we can meet our climate change goals as well. And so that transition as a major manufacturing hub, business hub, we need to get the transition moving into more sustainable. It's going to be a difficult process. And again, Singapore does no subsidies for energy prices. You just pay the price as it is. And maybe that may cause people to also adjust some of their expenditure. But it is something we are looking actively at. Thank you. <clears throat> My, I, I'm just asking ask a personal question. The, mo the moment I saw this, your advertisement on the online, mm -hmm. your name attracted my attention. I'm originally from Pakistan. My name is Sharik, but uh, Ashok Mirpuri. Are you connected with Kashmir, Mirpur area? No, it's in Pakistan. My parents were born in what is today. Oh, Mirpur, Oh, okay. Yes. So yeah, actually, I know, I know. Oh, I see. So at the, the partition, because they're Hindus, they had to leave. Yeah, yeah. And oh, then okay. Some, yeah, I'm, I'm from Sin too, basically. But okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. That's an easy question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway. oh, perfect. You talked a little bit about being so dependent on Malaysia and how you wanted to kind of step away from that by, like, self-production, do you think diversifying where you get your imports from could also be a solution? Or do you think you're more focused on self-production? You know, you always have to stay connected with your neighbor. If you look, look at my bio, I was High Commissioner to Malaysia. That means I represent a Commonwealth country. It's, it's, it's like an ambassador, except when we go from one Commonwealth country to the next, we call ourselves High Commissioners. So I spent four years in Malaysia. There is a dependence. And I like to think of it as interdependency, that we have to work together. Yes, we want to create some independence on food. We had a little crisis a few months ago when Malaysia, because of their own rising feed prices, they stopped exporting fresh chicken to Singapore, which means you couldn't do chicken rice. If you, Singapore chicken rice is really, <laughs> we eat it every day. It becomes a big political crisis. So you have to think, that, okay, now what do I do? But particularly, we have two bridges that connect Singapore and Malaysia. This connection is the, most, is the world's hev most heavily used cro border crossing every day. More than the crossings that people have between <coughs> you and Mexico has. Every day, 100,000 people, I'm guessing, maybe more, cross over from Malaysia to work in Singapore, and they go back at the end of the day to live over. 
They work in our restaurants, they work in our airport, they work in our seaport, they work in our factories. Singaporeans do the same. We don't cross in such large numbers, but it's really an expansion of our space where we can go for the weekend, uh, go, you know, go to the, they have lovely mountains, they have lovely restaurants, they have great golf courses. So it's, it's a real core dependence. We are, I was, the reason we got separated in 1965 is when we came together, and we were British colonies, we were mirror images of each other. Singapore's majority Chinese is a significant minority in Malaysia. Malaysia's majority Malay is a significant minority in Singapore. We just had differences over how we wanted to envisage our futures. For example, they said they wanted Malay to be the first language. We wanted English as the first language because we had to connect to the globe. That already meant your education systems have to start becoming a little they had different priorities in some of the things that they do there. Their political system is based on race-based parties that come together into a broad coalition. Singapore's political system is based on secular parties that bring all races in. Each one of these issues caused tensions, and so we had to separate. But that didn't mean that we wanted to be a permanent wall between the two of us. We want to make sure people can cross every day. They are train lines that go, we're talking about high-speed rails that will connect us. We're putting a metro-type system so that people from Malaysia don't have to drive in when they come to work. They take the metro into Singapore and take the metro back out. It's really a core interdependence that we think is a better way for the two of us. We're two separate countries, but in many of the areas, including some of our strategic outlooks, we work together in the Association of Southeast Asian Countries. But in many things, but there'll be certain things that I think each one needs to build a certain amount of resilience on our own. But we will always have to buy food from Malaysia. I, I cannot see that. Water and food always has to come from Malaysia. So uh, a question over here. Ambassador, I've uh, visited your beautiful country. My name is Mark Molesky. I'm a professor of business administration at Tungsis Community College. With the difficulties in Hong Kong, has there been any flow of business toward Singapore? Uh, anecdotally, yes, but not really in sort of the numbers that the newspapers seem to present it in. We actually were careful not to take away from Hong Kong's success. We think it is useful to Hong Kong, not a small, they don't have the kind of independent sovereignty that we have, but in a way they keep us on our toes. A little bit of competition is always good. Our civil service, we work very closely together. We deal with a lot of similar problems, housing, you know, in a small space, how do you get many of these things going? If your business is largely China focused, Hong Kong is probably where you're going to do it. I think what we are starting to see coming to Singapore, not just from Hong Kong, but from other parts of the region, is those people who want to do Asia business come to Singapore. And they just find it easier to move around. Unfortunately, because Hong Kong is still going through fairly rigid COVID rules, after two and a half years, some expatriates feel that it's impossible to do their regional jobs out of Hong Kong because you cannot fly out to Tokyo and come back. So then they want to move to Singapore. At least they can do a regional job and fly to Australia or fly to India or fly to Japan and do that. And uh, so we haven't quite seen sort of the evidence is not very clear yet. And it's not something that we actively encourage. Uh, there's a lot of also newspaper reporting about how Singapore house prices are going up because of all these people coming from Hong Kong. And again, that's something we need to manage domestically as well. But since you come from an educational ed institution, I should say a little bit about education in Singapore because it hasn't been asked here. It's really, I mean, without food, energy, and water, the only resource that we have is our people. And that's a real critical thing that we continue to develop through the years and make sure that we continue to develop it. I mentioned earlier that our schools are public schools. We want to make sure that every child has a good opportunity for the future. And so, Everyone goes to public schools. We make sure they're good teachers. It's not that easy to be a teacher in Singapore. 
You need to be from the top cohorts of your graduating class in order to be a teacher. You're then given teacher training because we think that that education is so important. Even during COVID, we told parents to stay home and work, but we got kids back into school as quickly as we could because we felt that's an important part of getting. And then if there was an outbreak in a particular class, we may shut the class down for a week. But we didn't want to shut the whole school down. Then we have got polytechnics, which take kids from the age of 16 or 17 to very basic technical training that gives them future opportunities. And, and the system is very flexible. You could go into a polytechnic and then go to a university. We have some now developed some of the world-class universities. If you look at the global university rankings, I think Singapore universities, we only have three. Uh, at least two are in the top 25 or top 30. And we partner with US institutions, British institutions, Australian institutions as well. But now the, the key thing for us is really continuing education. Because when someone leaves school, and you may see this in your students as well, the skills they have are no longer that relevant after five or six years. You need to keep bringing them back. So now we're working into how do we continue developing our f workforce for that future? Because as you leave school at 20 or 25, you're going to work till you're 65. How do you keep giving people new skills to keep them relevant? How do you encourage employers to do that? How do you encourage workers to go back to school? Uh, there are lots of programs to be able to do this. For example, now we're all going digital, which is okay for a 20-year-old, but how do you get a 40-year-old to get into the world of cybersecurity and digital? A lot of these things have to be. So we're very deliberate about education. I think it's one important part that sometimes people look at the Singapore model and say, we want to do it like you do. They tend to forget how important education is in this. So I know we are running out of time, uh, and you have to get to your next appointment. But I want to ask you what your final thoughts are. What what are the things that you want to make sure you leave with us? Leave with us today. I think the most important thing, again, what I started with, is the role of the United States. Every embassy in Washington D.C. is fully staffed. Everyone sends very senior diplomats over here because we all want attention from the U.S. The U.S. has really offered for a country like Singapore in my lifetime, but for many other countries as well, essentially you provided global goods for all of us. We benefited from the peace and stability that the U.S. brought in, and we want to see that continue. We want to see the U.S. continue to play that role globally, opening markets, uh, making sure I mean, when U.S. companies invest in Singapore, it's not because we don't see it as a zero-sum game of them giving up a facility in Connecticut to go to Singapore. It's because there are new markets opening up. New markets have opened up because of the U.S. role. You are selling new products over there that providing peace and stability, we didn't get into the South China Sea, the US does freedom of navigation operations, make sure that international waters are open. These rules of the road that the US has helped us build, helped us benefit from, I think that's the most important thing that we, the world wants to see the US continue to do. And even as the US goes through challenges, you know, I think that that focus on the world, the focus on everything happening, that's what the rest of the world really appreciates. So, I mean, something that I tell my friends in the U.S. administration and in, on Capitol Hill and as I travel around the country, we appreciate this. We've benefited because of this, and we want it to continue. So thank you all for being here. And, uh, thank you. Thank you for being here. Certainly a very special experience, and we're very grateful and honored to have you with us today. Thank, thank you. you.